So you have heard exciting ideas and the project plan we put together for this topic, AI for clean energy and uh, uh, climate resilience. You heard the students talk, but uh, when we execute this plan, we realize we cannot do it alone. We have to collaborate. And the collaboration needs to happen at different dimension. Public-private collaboration, utility sector or energy sector with IT sector collaboration, domestic collaboration, and also international collaboration. So with that, we have a, a very interesting panel. And uh, in the first afternoon session, talk about innovation through collaboration. I'd like to welcome Pamela Anson from Department of Energy to the stage, Thomas Baer from Eon, and uh, Guha from Google. OK, uh, the format for this session uh, each of them will have about five to 10 minutes to share, share their perspective on this topic. They may highlight a very interesting in, uh, uh, initiative on their organization. They may share very challenging problems they have on their organization. Then after that, we're going to have, uh, we'll prepare a couple questions for them, but uh, I try not to use my question. I look forward to have a question from you guys as well. As I mentioned earlier, this is your meeting. Okay. And, uh, uh, we will start with uh, uh, Dr. Eisen. Dr. Pamela Eisen is a director of Artificial Intelligence Technology Office at the Department of Energy. Pamela? Um, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. And I want to say thanks for uh, having me here today to speak with you a little bit and talk to you about what's going on at the department. Uh, I'm the director of the Artificial Intelligence and Technology Office. It's quite an honor to be in that role, and I just want to share a few things with you about what's going on. Uh, but I tell you, uh, so far, I feel like I'm in a setting where I'm around peers and people that can relate to some of the things that I'm most concerned with. So it's been quite refreshing to be here. Um, I am very focused on responsible and trustworthy AI. And I don't see that as a um, expression or a cliche. Uh, we take it very seriously. Um, when we are looking at using artificial intelligence for uh, making sure that energy is distributed fairly, that it is distributed equitably, um, that's what we mean when we say responsible and trustworthy. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit more than uh, something that uh, someone is just saying or a piece of uh, a principle that's put in some legislation. Um, so the Secretary of Energy, she has a, a perspective on uh, artificial intelligence, and I just wanted to point that out here. I'm not going to read it, but it is clear that she is saying that, um, that it is necessary uh, to save lives, and it's a matter of economic and national security. And we all know that, and that is why this is so important. And that is why AI and the use of AI for uh, mitigating the risks associated with climate change uh, must be adopted, it must be used in a responsible and trustworthy manner. So I am not gonna read these, but I will just say that at the forefront of everything that we do, is first of all the, the executive order on climate change and the requirements that are there and the, the sense of urgency. But in addition, when I'm dealing with and when I'm talking about responsible and trustworthy and the use and adoption and the thoughtfulness that needs to go into building AI uh, solutions, there are three executive orders that come to mind. So the promoting the use of trustworthy AI the advancing racial equity. So that was the one when I first started talking to people about AI and responsible and trustworthiness. And then I'd tie in this executive order and I would get these blank stares like, what? And that, but you've heard this all day. You've heard it today and you heard it yesterday. And then improving the nation's cybersecurity. So those are just three um, executive orders, but there, it overlays with everything, right? AI is infused in everything. So real quick, the vision of my office, I direct the AITO office, is to transform the department into a world-leading uh, enterprise 
when it comes to the research, the development, the discovery, the delivery, adoption of AI. And so we're here as uh, coordinators and advocates for the office. We're the glue in the office that helps pull the organizations together. We believe that the sum is much, much greater than the individual parts. And that's a tough job, but that's the responsibility of my office. And so we're not saying AI, AI is the answer to every uh, energy problem, but we are saying that where, where it makes sense to use AI, that we should do so and in a responsible way. So this is an image of my office. There, we, there I am sitting in the center there. And there are you, There's, there you are. There is uh, the program offices within DOE. And we are the convening organization and the drivers for, uh, we are the catalyst for change. Um, and we are there to pull the organization together, look for gaps, look for issues, look for uh, open space, and then uh, help us uh, bring solutions to bear in an in a organized fashion. And then I won't go much into this because I want to save things for the, the panel itself. But these are some of the things that, I'm, that we're focused on. Strategic planning. So I'm responsible for the DOE, DOE's AI strategic plan. And that's under works. We just stood up the AI Advancement Council. Uh, we're very focused on workforce development and making sure that the skills are where it needs to be. And that's one of the concerns that we have. And then the responsible and trustworthy AI. So these are the goals, and we're on track with hitting our goals and objectives. And the important thing is to tie it to energy and climate and be able to help folks understand that we're not implementing AI for AI's sake, that this is all about impacts and uh, driving results and, and uh, solutions that matter. So we're real focused on going from uh, research and development to actually actual mission outcomes. So I won't go into the council here, but you can, this gives you a sense that it is five council members. Um, they are the highest, some of the highest officials within the department. The Undersecretary of Science and Innovation is a co-chair, and, and the Undersecretary for Nuclear Security is a co-chair. And then I sit on the council, um, and then the general council is there, as well as the uh, intelligence and counterintelligence. But to counter or to complement the council is the program committee, and that, that's the program offices and representatives from the program offices in the department. And uh, the last thing I'll point out is, again, very focused on outcomes. Um, we, are, we have stood up the Responsible and Trustworthy AI Task Force. Um, we are very focused on establishing ethical uh, principles and equity principles and practices more so than principles, but we need both. Um, and then we're looking into next generation AI. Um, and we can talk about that during the discussion if you're interested. And as I said, I'm working on the AI strategy. Uh, the team is, almost, we're done, it's going through the vetting process. We believe in innovative governance. We believe in advancing the AI ecosystem. And I won't touch on this one. I'll leave the slides and you can take it. But this is an example of one of our outcomes. In addition to the council itself, another example outcome is an integrated development environment. And honestly, this needs to happen in collaboration with industry, academia, uh, independent researchers, researchers, as well as other government agencies. So not just an integrated development environment, but also uh, equity hubs. So we've been, there's a, there's a real push for uh, establishing e equity hubs so that information is representative. And so that led into the next slide, which is speaking to uh, distribution of solar as one of the concerns and one of the value propositions of equity and why equity in the energy transformation is so important. Uh, we don't want to exclude communities in data sets, and that's easy. It seems easy to do, so we find that to be a problem. Um, deep fakes, content authenticity, got to deal with content authenticity. Uh, if we are going to make a change when it comes to accelerating the risks associated with climate change, 
Um, we need content authenticity. And then balancing the science and reasoning. That's where AI comes in as well. There must be a balance. So it's a social type of technology. And that's basically what I wanted to go over. These are just examples of the energy grid, the predictive maintenance, home energy management, all examples of applied artificial intelligence to make a difference in the day and time of um, the, the uh, energy transition and the transformation. And the last thing is on my mind is what I just said. I'm very concerned about um, the, the fact that AI is underutilized when it comes to climate and grid resiliency. There is such an opportunity to do more. Um, AI for energy transformation is necessary. I think there needs to be some type of consortium to that extent. And then we need, to, we need more significant data um, management uh, underway. OK. Thank you, Pamela. And uh, just hold it. I know some of you may have questions. Let's hold the question a little bit until we finish another uh, two quick overviews. So uh, many of you, some of you were here on Monday and uh, have heard the uh, five-side conversation between Condi Rice and uh, uh, Arun Bajinda. Uh, regarding what's going on in Europe and the, any, the importance of the energy security issue. Now, we are very glad to have uh, Thomas Baer, is a senior VP and the chief innovation and the strategy officer from EON, which really give us the first-hand perspective and opinion of what's happening in Germany. Yeah, thank you, uh, Liang. At least I give you first-hand uh, information of what is happening in our company. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I would like to share a quick snapshot about the E.ON strategy and appropriate to the great auditory here today, uh, I would like to highlight in particular our chances and challenges which come along with innovation, technology and partnerships uh, to make the E.ON strategy happen. And on that note, um, we as E.ON, we are founding members of the Bits and Watts program and I want to thank you, Liang, and the entire Precord Institute for Energy for the great collaboration and the inspiring impulses they are setting, right? It's really amazing. So, and before I jump now into the matter, let me uh, share one pre-remark on a personal, personal note, a quick statement about one concern which is uh, in everyone's mind these days. We are all struck by the terrible war in our neighborhood uh, in Europe, the war in Ukraine. And our compassion, of course, is uh, with all the victims who lost their lives, their beloved, their homes. Uh, and we as E.ON, especially our colleagues in uh, Central Eastern Europe, which are all really almost at the front line with their business in Slovakia, in, in, in Poland, in Hungary, uh, we are trying to do whatever we could do uh, to help, right? Um, and it's almost a second order problem when we talk about business impact there. Uh, yeah. But um, I got asked quite frequently those days, what is the point of having a strategy at all in that moment? Aren't we back on square one with all the energy transformation and stuff like that in light of these uh, terrible um, events in, in Europe? My answer is, and that is what I want to bring across today um, with my short talk, it is even more valid and more necessary and more powerful to execute a transformation strategy now. Uh, what we see today in the market, policymakers, uh, regulators, um, that is all a resounding confirmation that our way towards energy transformation is really, really the right thing. Yeah. So, but let's get into the, into the matter. Um, just a few words about our business portfolio because it, that's also important in that context. Our strong pillars in uh, energy networks and customer solutions make us one of the largest European energy service companies, straight in the middle of where energy transformation happens. Our distribution network, which is the largest in Europe, with some 1.6 kilometers of lines, it's the backbone of the transformation because energy transformation happens in the distribution grid. Uh, we connect 800,000 renewable plants uh, to our networks and this is a number which ex uh, exponentially grows literally as we speak. 
That is a journey which comes along with a strong move towards digitization, a necessary prerequisite for the whole transformation to happen at all. Uh, and I come back to that in a minute. Our customer solutions uh, support our 50 million customers in 15 countries in Europe uh, to become part of the transition themselves. Um, we don't own large generation assets anymore. Hence, we are a pure downstreamer in energy and we are driven by a strong vision to bring good energy to the people and to make energy transformation happen. And that is based on, on a set of core beliefs, technological and uh, societal core beliefs, uh, as of what will happen and what needs to be done for getting to net zero in Europe uh, till 2050 at the latest. We believe in electrification of industry and society. We need to expand the renewable production on the continent as much as we can, but that will still leave us uh, with almost the same amount of energy which still needs to come uh, as imports to Europe, if you want so, as green electrons stored in molecules. And we will see these energy carriers converging all over the place. And then we will face an energy system of the future which, which will become simply too complex to be managed by only putting more copper into the ground. The world of tomorrow will simply be, not be able to control it by human brains only. We need to radically change the way we do our business by consequent digitization and employment of emerging digital technology to the utmost extent to get to the net zero while keeping the lights on. Yeah. So, I mean, if you forget everything I'm talking about today, uh, which I hope is not the case, uh, there are three things which could stick as the core paradigms of our strategy. First of all, it's sustainability as a value generator for business and not as a bureaucratic burden. Digitization as a true game changer uh, of our business and growth, sustainable growth driven by the sector transformation and our role therein in the first place. So these three things, this is a very busy, busy chart which explains a bit why sustainability is such a huge driver for us. The bottom line is, First of all, our infrastructure, our grid infrastructure enables all other market players uh, in Europe to get green. Putting a windmill somewhere which is outpouring electrons is not a big deal anymore. Bringing the right electron at the right time to the right place certainly is. Yeah. Um, we have more than 30,000 industrial sites uh, under contract where lowering the CO2 footprint it's a technological challenge everyone is dealing with and we deliver the products for. And we build the infrastructure and customer applications of tomorrow on our journey towards green gas and the hydrogen uh, uh, economy. Um, and just a snapshot, the billion dollar question is how to get the heat green. Uh, that is a big unsolved. Uh, how to decarbonize the hard to abate industries those who apply high temperature processes like chemistry, glass makers, um, uh, ceramics, uh, and what have you. And how to con even convert the households uh, in the big cities uh, getting green, right? And coming to digitization, also a very busy chart uh, I could talk about for hours, but the bottom line is decarbonization means electrification of society. Electrification means end-to-end -end digitization throughout the whole value chain. And I skip the details of the digitization program and I come to some examples. Yeah. A quick one here is um, how uh, digital, digitization enables us to transform a very hands-on physical process into digital. It is the vegetation management. I learned a bit that this is an area of interest here in California. Um, you know we have to cut the trees and bushes around our power landlines just for safety and maintenance reasons, which in the past we did rather harshly, right? Chopping all green down to the roots just to be on the safe side. Now the target is 
to cut as much as necessary, but as little as possible. Right? To do so, we use a digitally analyzed LIDAR data to determine the right amount of cuts to be made to manage our subcontractors. Their work will be verified by satellite imaging and computer vision techniques, uh, and they will be used to identify critical ve 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 vegetation which is coming back. We already do that in Sweden with 8,000 kilometers of landline, and we're going to roll it out to out the 50,000 kilometers of landline of our group. That will save 700,000 tons of CO2 at the end. And that's not a piece of cake that really moves the needle, right? Another example is um, the Eon Metaverse. Uh, we will launch it June this year, which is the first of its kind uh, in the energy world that will be a completely new digital experience for customers, employees, and scientists, which will fill with first value generating use cases early on. Um, imagine the live demonstration, for example, of an industrial customer to walk him through the alternatives of modernizing his CCGT um, or heat recovery system or a word, a waste circulating or something like that. Or we set up a carbon exchange offset uh, uh, system in the metaverse. Many ways to visualize complex uh, data in the space and the opportunities of this uh, new uh, experience space are almost endless. All right. So last but not least, what means growth to us? Just in a nutshell, E.ON will invest 27 billion uh, in the next five years into sustainable growth mainly fueled by the energy transformation. Exponential growth of renewables uh, in all our uh, regionalities, we are active. New data warehouses, gigafactories growing like mushrooms, they all need to be connected. That is, I mean, don't quote me for that, but that is growth you cannot, uh, you can hardly run away from. Right? That is really, that is, that is something we have to do. Yeah? Um, we distinguish between areas in our core with steady growth over the years. These are the growth engines. But in some areas we call exponential wildcards, the build out of the EV charging infrastructure in Europe, a new digital platform for third party access to grid services behind the meter and before the meter, B2C solutions for residential customers who also want to progressively be part of the, of the green journey. All right, let me, let me close here. The, the point I want to bring across, there is a completely new game of energy emerging, emerging and we have the impression that will be our game yeah, as downstream utilities, as utilities with a vision, with a vision of bringing good energy to the people. And this transformation ahead of us is already real and happening and it will offer huge chances for us. The key to success is innovation, technology, entrepreneurial spirit, and partnerships on that way. Partnership with other companies, from startups to industrials. We have um, participations in more than 50 startups all over the world, uh, but also with scientists and with academia, with our academia partnerships. So thank you very much for, it, for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. So we have heard the watts perspective, then I think with bits and watts, you know, naturally, we'd love to hear the bits perspective. And uh, Jay Preco asked on Monday, you know, whereas IT companies, we should engage IT company on this energy transition. So now the answer is here. So we are very glad to have uh, Guha here, fellow and the VP of Google. But uh, another thing he is doing right now is the founder and the leader developer for the Data Commons. Guha. Thank you, Liam. And um, it's really great to be here. About five years ago, I was standing here talking about this thing I was going to head to, you know, wanted to get built. And Arun pulled me aside and said, jump in the trenches and start building it yourself. And so five years later, here's the report card, Arun. So to set truisms to set the context, there's a ton of data out there from all of these different entities. This data is essential for everything from science and journalism and policy. And using this data is in, unfortunately incredibly painful. It involves data wrangling, done, which is repeated over and over again. 
There's an analogy with satellite imagery. In 1998-99, NASA had its Landsat imagery up on its website. It was so difficult to use, almost nobody did. Google Earth and Maps came along, did all this data wrangling once and for all, and literally changed the way we look at the world around us. Today, if you want to ask a question like, which California counties uh, are more uh, at risk from climate change? Well, the data to answer that exists, but it's so difficult to use. In fact, the first step in answering that question is to write a grant proposal. Imagine instead if you could just walk up and ask a natural language and start beginning your exploration. So what we've been doing for the last almost five years now is we've taken a very, very large number of data sets. We've done all those data wrangling. We've cleaned it, normalized it, aligned the references, built schemas on top of schema.org, and built this giant knowledge graph. It's too big for most people to download, so we provide APIs on top of which different kinds of applications can be built. The four target audiences, consumers, who can just ask a natural language, policies and folks and journalists, what I call non-programming researchers, dashboards and visualization tools for them, application builders, and one very special community of builders, which is people building AI models to do different kinds of things. There's three pillars to AI, algorithms, compute power, and data. If there's no data, there is no AI, and that's why data commons comes in in this context. So what we've built, one is an open source um, infrastructure for creating and storing and uh, building these knowledge graphs visualizations. There's integration into Google search engine, but 90 plus percent of the work is elbow grease in terms of demographics, economics, health, climate, energy, food, crime. It, to give you an idea of the scale, it's about three billion time series. Uh, it's about four times the size of FRED, which is the Federal Reserve's economic database that they use to run the, the country's economic decisions. You know, just some examples of the, you can go to Google's, um, Google today and type in these kinds of queries and get answers. Everything from energy use per capita in India to incredibly complicated questions like number of poor Hispanic women in Santa Clara County. A driving application for, uh, for the last two plus years has been sustainability. Um, climate change is happening. And it's not as simple as 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees versus 2.5 degrees. Climate deltas vary widely. This is, in all the visualizations I'll be showing you today is all based on data and visualizations from datacommons.org. This is uh, um, temperatures as, uh, as predicted by one of NASA's popular models in 2050 relative to 2006, according to RCP uh, 2.6, which is the most optimistic scenario. And you can see that even in this ultra-optimistic scenario, there's gonna be places in this country where the temperature goes up by more than seven degrees centigrade. There are other places where it goes down by four and a half degrees centigrade. To use Aaron's analogy, it doesn't matter if you have your head in the oven and, the, and foot in the um, um, freezer, it both you're in trouble, and that's what's going to happen. The other point is that there's many existing inequities, everything from hunger and poverty and diabetes and health insurance, and the, the, the list goes on. And climate change will worsen these inequities, and we have to prepare. And in order to prepare, we have to know who is gonna be most affected 10, 20, 30 years from now. And in order to figure out who's gonna be most affected, we need data not just about the climate, but data about food, health, farming, water, employment, and so much more. These are very messy data ecosystems. Just at the US federal level, the data about this data is distributed across so many different agencies. Data Commons mission is to organize this data and make it universally accessible, which you might notice is Google's mission. And because this is so important, Google is doing this in an open fashion. Not only is the data open, the software stack is open, the entire process is open, and so that everybody can participate. Everything we do is on GitHub. You can download our code, you can download the data. And we do expect there'll be you know, companies and others who build applications for profit on top of this. But this is so much elbow grease, it's kind of pointless to do it over and over again. So we should just do it once and make it available everywhere. Uh, many, many, many topics have already been covered, everything from all of these topics and many, many more, and they're coming in at an, in, you know, at an ever-increasing rate. But to give you an idea of the kind of stuff we can do, let me just walk you through a few examples. Um, we all know that with heat, uh, cardiac conditions become worse. This is one of our visualizations. Each dot here is a U.S. county, and the x-axis is... Talk. So the x-axis is the expected temperature rise, the y-axis is prevalence of cardiac conditions. What's interesting are the places, the counties to the top and right. If you look right at the top there, there are counties in South Dakota, there are counties in New Mexico, and so on. 
which have a high incidence of cardiac this thing, which are going to become much worse. And unfortunately, if you drill down, you'll realize that so many of these count counties are where um, Native American um, reservations are. In many ways, what we need, uh, during the pandemic, we relied heavily on uh, the dashboards from Johns Hopkins to figure out what was going on. For the next 10, 20 years, we need dashboards like that, except a thousand times more sophisticated, a thousand times more complicated, not just dashboards, platforms that we can run our code, our models, our analysis on. And this is exactly what we're building. This is you know, you know, irrigated land versus projected temperatures to tell you what kind of places we can have most kind of uh, effect. This is, and of course, uh, you know, we collaborate a lot, and our first and most favorite collaborator, especially now that we're here, is Arun. And uh, this is IPCC temperature, uh, this is the wet bulb temperatures, and uh, it's kind of one of these places, times where I wish we were wrong, and um, uh, India actually hit those temperatures uh, last week. Um, not good. Um, there's one last important point, which is the model is not one data commons, one ring to bind them all. It's much more like websites. We have many different websites. And all these different websites share a common schema, which is HTML, and a common API, which is HTTP. Some websites are behind firewalls, some behind paywalls, some are open. But they're all, you don't switch your browser when you go from your intranet to the public web. And your intranet can link to the public web. The same model over here, which is that you can have these private or other data commons, and the analog of linking is joining. A great example of this is, um, you know, uh, IIT Madras, the, the best IIT, of course, uh, you know, set up a, a, a data commons which is India focused. And they're especially focused on water issues. So the, the black dots there are the glaciers that are feeding the Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra, which together feed a billion people. And when the temperatures at these places, at these points, go up by more than a certain extent, they stop being able to hold water. And then we're going to have a billion people potentially starve. And preparing for that is going to take on the order of decades. Um, coming back, uh, Feeding America is another one of these uh, partnerships. Uh, Feeding America is an NGO in this country which helps run about 2,000 food pantries. And they have developed this uh, interesting index of, for food insecurity. And which takes us to, you, know, you can go to datacommons.feedingamerica.org and to go back to the first question I asked, which California counties are most at risk from, feeding, uh, from rising temperatures? The x-axis is their food insecurity index. The y-axis is the temperature rise. And you can see it's the interior agricultural counties which are most at risk. To end on a positive note, this is solar energy potential versus poverty. There are places which are very poor but which have high solar potential where we should be investing more in. Um, as I said, we like to, love to collaborate. It's all open. Um, go to datacommons.org, collaborate more with us. Thank you. Thank you, Kuha. So we have heard the California pg and &E perspective this morning. We have Australia, have Germany, and Guha mentioned a little bit on what's going on in India. So my first question to all of you is really about all the pledge to be net zero by a certain time, whatever it's 2050 or 2060 or even longer. And uh, because last weekend, Saturday, many of you may realize or may not realize the whole California grid was running on clean electricity for two minutes in the late afternoon, April, 20, uh, April 30, okay? And uh, so do you think in Europe, in the United States, or any other countries, can we reach net zero by 2050 or by 2060 or longer? I would start from this end, from Thomas to Pamela, then to Guha. First, give me a quick answer, yes or no? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Certainly, yes. Yeah. Okay, Pamela? I think yes by 2050. Okay, good. Guha? I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Yeah. I think it's a much more complicated question than that. Okay, then that's the next opportunity you guys have. If we can reach net zero by 2050, what should we do? What's the risk we are facing? What's the transition, energy transition risk we are facing? Especially under the situation like in your region, uh, the war is going on, and uh, also in the United States has a different change of administration and different uh, states, the state-federal coordination, and also the, what's the role of IT company? Let's start from, again, from Thomas. 
Well, I mean, um, I, I guess uh, the, uh, the biggest challenges are not so much on the technological side, although they are huge, but they are, in my point of view, all manageable. Um, my point of view, the biggest uh, risk on that way uh, is the challenge of the society transformation we are uh, facing. Yeah? You, uh, at the end of the day, our continent uh, is or the European Community, for example, is 27 countries, which means 28 regulations. Uh, very different uh, mindsets on what is the role of politicians and regulations and what is the, what is the, the role of the industry. Um, and uh, we see a lot of, uh, let's say, counterbalancing action right now in the crisis. Um, what we see on the positive end is a rebalancing of what we call the energy trilemma, uh, the, the, the good balance between sustainability, affordability, and security of supply. That gains a lot of importance what it did not have in the past years. The flip side and the dark side of it is a lot of politicians are overshooting with uh, over-regulating the markets. And that, in my point of view, could be um, uh, a big setback on this way, yeah, clearly. I definitely think that, uh, I definitely, can you hear me? Can you say something? He said, hey, we can show the mic. That's good. Yeah. So I definitely think that uh, to, to get to where we want to be by 2050, I know our, our goals are more aggressive than that in the United States, but for 2050, I think it's possible. And the reason why I say that is because we are paying attention to uh, the climate change. We are paying attention to uh, infrastructure and grid resiliency. And so as long as we stay focused on that and also remember our neighboring uh, countries, because again, there's a ripple effect. So as long as we pay attention to that and are action oriented, which someone talked about being actionable earlier today, um, and if you know me at all, I'm uh, very much about stop talking, let's do. And I believe that from a climate crisis perspective that we are doing something about it. I do want to say something real quick about artificial intelligence, if it's okay. So AI can um, either, uh, I was in this discussion earlier with some students and they, they said, just use the word amplify. So um, AI, can amplify good and it can amplify not so good. As long as we are paying attention like we are now, um, AI we're, we're looking at how we can use AI to better um, solutions to address climate change, to address grid resiliency, to look at how we can um, accelerate and process the magnitudes of data and the different data types. And as I said earlier, I don't think that's the sole answer, but I do think that it's an instrumental part of mitigating the risk of climate change. We have to know, and I think we're, we can do more of this, but I do believe by 2050 we're, we're gonna be there. We have to be able to anticipate crises before they occur. And they don't always have to be crises that have already occurred because that's past data and that's old. So we're gonna have to be able to anticipate that that we don't know. And that is what, the, that is what happened with, that is what's happening in some of the communities and some of the crisis that we've had. We didn't know how to deal with it because we weren't prepared. So we're gonna have to prepare ourselves and AI can help us with that. So the artificial intelligence and simulated data as well as real data based on historical experiences can help us with that. And the last thing I'll say is your links. So if there's a chain, there's links in the chain. And all of those links is what makes the chain a chain. Every community matters. Equity matters. Equity ma Until we pay attention to equity and ethical responsibility, we're not gonna get where we need to be when it comes to the climate crisis. But I think we're working at it, and I think it's possible. Guha, you want to add your perspective? Or you want another question from me? Yeah, a different question. <laughs> Very good. So that's a question for you, to continue what Camila <laughs> said. OK, I think that you guys would love the, the AI question more yeah, than Yeah, sure. The, the Let me answer that question, which yeah, I think she answered, which is, 
what are some of the near-term things that AI can do? Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to go incredibly specific. Um, there's a lot of problems which are, um, have essentially computationally unsolvable. Um, everything from you know uh, grid optimize uh, OPF and mm -hmm. to uh, you know actually solving Navier Stokes and all of these kinds of things. I'm really excited by more uh, recent solutions which don't try to actually solve the problem but use uh, various deep neural network techniques to get somewhere in the neighborhood of a solution. Uh, and you go from you know you, like I forget the name of the student who showed four orders of magnitude improvement, right? Uh, that actually gives us the opportunity to do uh, that together with sensing technology and so on and so forth can change the name of the game in many, many, many different dimensions. That's absolutely huge. Um, and we're going to need to bring that in to reduce. So we look at the, in order to go net zero, we have to be able to reduce the cost of producing a calorie of food. And that's not going to happen the way we are doing it right now. If anything, the cost of a calorie, energy cost of a calorie is going up as the consumption of beef is going up. How do we address those kinds of issues? Yeah. Um, in material science, there's long-standing problems, which you know, many people, including people in Aaron's lab, are making some progress, uh, essentially doing a, a variant of using deep neural networks to investigate incredibly large search spaces. Um, so, it's, it's positive. And, and you know, I don't know enough about those material science or food stuff, but the one place we can help is in many, many, many of these projects, grad students spend 70, 80% of their time bringing together the data set, cleaning it up, doing it over and over and over again. If they could instead operate um, on a common platform so that um, one of my favorite examples on this is What's the relationship between poverty and, and unemployment and hypertension and obesity? Well, that would be on the order of a term project kind of size project, given that the data comes from four, three or four different federal organizations and so on. Once the, you can assume, you can open a Python notebook anywhere and assume the data just exists with a common API. It's now being done in Berkeley in under an hour by 400 plus students for grade. And if you can br bring that level of advancement and that level of speed, essentially if you can empower every student out there to do things four times, uh, sorry, four orders of magnitude faster, interesting things are going to happen. Okay. I, uh, before I let you go, follow-on question, let's ask from your side to Thomas, is really, what's your view of the level adoption in the power and energy sector? I pretty much know the answer, but I would like to <laughs> hear you again, you know, what, what's your view? Because you've been dealing with an, a many industry. You're dealing with healthcare, dealing with a, you know, social network, consumer uh, behavior, etc. What's your view, Guha? The level of adoption of AI in the power and energy sector. Let's we'll start from you, then we'll to Pamela and Thomas. Let's use Again, this way, I elementary I, school, not, high I'm, school, or uni university level. I, I'm not qualified enough to answer that. But my, based on my conversations with Ram, um, Raj Gopal, and Arun, uh, there is, let's say, room for improvement. Same. Uh, room for improvement. Good. Just, just a, a, a quick, quick anecdote. When I started in the utility business in the very early 2000s, my colleagues told me, you know, more than four percent of renewable, fluctuating renewable energy in the grid simply won't work. Yeah? It will bring it to the collapse uh, because uh, the grid is, we have such a central uh, focused architecture. It will, uh, let's say, uh, create some swings and the whole system collapsed. I mean, we have uh, uh, hours and days uh, in, in, in northwestern Germany uh, where, uh, let's say, over hours, uh, the whole system is supplied by renewable uh, energy only in the meanwhile. So 20 years later, we have, in average, uh, in Germany, 50% of renewables in the system. And we are managing the grid literally, by and large, with the same methods as we did 20 years back. There, by now, there is not very much emerging tech, uh, digital technologies in it. And the question we all ask ourselves, when do we hit the iceberg? Where is the infliction point where it simply doesn't work anymore? Yeah? 
Uh, and we have, we have the impression we are very close to it, that the system is simply not manageable because of the sheer amount of electrons in the system and the sheer uh, necessity of creating self-organizing systems where the point of generation of electrons and the point of uh, consumption needs to come closer to each other, yeah, um, really demands these technologies. Um, so a clear answer, we will see AI, but also distributed ledger technologies, um, um, augmented reality, um, all these technologies throughout the whole value chain. I'm 100% convinced. Terrific. Let me make a pause here and see question from the audience. So, Gua, as you were describing the data commons, I was just smiling and thinking, ooh, new toy sort, sort, sort of thing, but with such uh, um, incredible information indeed to guide decision making and address new questions, um, in particular related to sustainability issues. My question to you is the, the, the data um, comes with a different levels of quality, and so, how is the treatment of uncertainty across multiple data streams um, reasonably addressed? So that, that would be one. And the second one comes related to uh, Dr. Isam's uh, talk, the part on responsibility. A lot of the things in terms of visualizations are correlations and not causation. So how to address those two layers importantly as this effort continues to grow? Yeah, let me answer both questions. A very great question. Thank you. Um, the first one is you have data from you know everything from the U.S. Census to some state in in, in India, and there's often so. What the uh, short answer is: a we maintain the provenance of every single data point all the way down to the code that was used to clean the original data source, all the way down to the original files that it came from, so that you have transparency. And then second level. Uh, we have for uh, surfaces like Google uh, Search, we use only a small number of the data sets that are uh, sources, uh, which are sort of hopefully beyond reproach, like the World Bank, US Census, uh, things from peer reviewed journals, and so on. Uh, and then finally, for researchers, you can actually filter your query by specifying you want only data from these sources. Uh, the second question you raise is a much, much, much bigger one, and it's a debate that we've gone through, which is, yeah, you can look at a certain core in a scatter plot and say that's a causation. It's not. It's something else is going on. Is the solution to say, no, you can't do the scatter plot, or is it to figure out ways of educating whoever is doing it? Because if somebody who wants to create misinformation will find a way of getting the scatter plot, because it's not that we are, it's there. It's just, uh, and so, a big part of what we are trying to do is actually um, work with communication school uh, departments and, and journalism schools uh, to fund competitions to help people tell the story. Because at the end of the day, charts like that are useless. They need to be told in a, to a much larger audience of people, very few of whom are in this room, especially politicians and so on, in terms of stories that they can relate to. And as part of that, also educate uh, sort of critical data thinking, if you will, in terms of understanding the distinction between causation and correlation and a whole bunch of these things. Um, and for uncertainty, uh, to add on top of what was said, I think that uncertainty, um, so there's a, there's a certain level of fear when it comes to AI and then there's, why is that the case? And I think where we have an opportunity to, to build up that confidence is to uh, look at, so track ways to identify the level of uncertainty and what to do with the response or the results or the predictions of the AI based on that uncertainty. And it all depends on situations. It's very situational. 
And so there is opportunity, though, to really start taking a look at and have the models convey back the level of uncertainty when a, uh, a, a prediction is about to be made. The uncertainty level is X. And the humans in the loop, when they talk about the, the uh, human-centered AI, here they talk about the human-centered AI. And that's so important because that's where that comes into the picture so that um, the validation that's needed is infused into the process. And we aren't 100% there yet, but it's something that's getting attention. It is a fundamental requirement when it comes to making sure that if I'm gonna use AI to help to tell me how, um, where the solar panels are across the various homes, and where are the opportunities to uh, improve the solar panels before they break, right? So as an example, mm -hmm. uh, AI is gonna give me that insight through computer visioning, et cetera, et cetera. I need to be able to count on their data that is given me back. And it is based on the data that it gets, but it's also based on how we make the verification, the validation, deal with the uncertainty. And that is something that is getting attention. It's a very good question. It's something that's getting attention. It's like how we deal with uncertainty today as humans. How do we deal with it, right? You, you have to, and the, you, we need to think about that. And the last thing I'll say is the diversity or the, the interdisciplinary teams when we are building the algorithms, when we are establishing the models, and even when we are uh, establishing the data sets, there needs to be that interdisciplinary set of teams involved, not just what you're familiar with. That, and then that's when, yeah, so that will help with some of that. But definitely we have to deal with uncertainty. Um, so I deal with Emma with ML quite a bit uh, for solving Navier Stokes specifically, and um, I was wondering how all of you think about generalizing out of sample because ultimately you have to go into the future, which we have no data for. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? I'm all for it. I'm all for um, moving out. I'm, I'm mixed, so there's the machine learning element, and then there's the more generalized is where I think you're going to, and where there's not that much human in the loop, but I don't think we're ready yet. But I do think that, uh, that uh, this, is, this is where we are going, and I'm in favor of it. So, yeah, great question. I don't think the community has an answer for it yet. It's just early stages of papers. Look, I got an interesting result. I got yeah. an interesting result. Like, uh, why? How you just... Or how? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with, uh, with you both. What I want to add uh, to that question is it has a, a social and even a regional component in it. Yeah? Um, uh, as I said, we are doing business in 15, uh, 15 countries, from uh, Sweden in the north to Italy in the south, from UK to Turkey. And the way people approach technology, technological progress, uh, uh, data security, is, it differs widely. Yeah? Uh, I mean, as an example, in Sweden we are rolling out a second generation of smart meters already. In Germany we have not even started only due to, a, a, let's say, an, an almost irrational fear uh, of data fraud. Uh, and uh, I mean, we take uh, data security very seriously, but uh, it, is, it is absolutely bizarre, right? Um, the, the, the German way of reading meters is still uh, uh, someone goes in the basement, takes a card, writes down the meter and, uh, and, and sends it to the utility, mixes up the gas meter with a power meter, a big headache, yeah? um, and, and um, it differs between big cities, between countryside, and so on. Um, I, I guess our answer is we have to find positive showcases for it. We have to, uh, to, to, to take a first move here and there, even on our own expenses, and, and say, look, this is the area where we try to employ all what is possible today and have a look and feel and, and, and see how it works. We have to we have to um, create this positive uh, showcases to convince people at the end of the day. 
There is one point, however, I'm sorry, I'm diving back into the weeds over here. Um, mm. If you look at the different climate models, right? This is like IPCC, CMIP-6 has like 80 models or something like that. They vary across, the range of predictions is so large, it's like six degrees centigrade across. And you look at them and you say, wait, you're just ignoring cloud cover and you're placing such a huge weight on cloud cover because that's all unknown. Um, there's an approach that is being used by two of our own students, both of whom I saw earlier who have disappeared, uh, which is basically say, look, I'm gonna ignore Navy Stokes and all that. I'm just gonna look at historic trends and, and together with CO2 rises, et cetera, and then you, because we have so many weather stations all around the place, to see if that works better because intuitively you could say that those models are also incorporating the impact of cloud cover and ocean temperatures and you know butterflies in, in Central Park or whatever. I'm not saying it's going to work. It is an interesting thing, an alternative approach to, and it's, it's at the end of the day, it's like things like Navier Stokes and all of these things are sort of analytic solutions that are based on causal models of the universe. And then you have machine learning, which is basically curve fitting, very high number of dimensions. And, and I don't know, which, I like, actually I'd like to, love, like to hear your thoughts on this topic. Okay, great. <laughs> this is a giant setup for your talk, wonderful. That's a question she prepared for herself, so. <laughs> okay, we have about a couple minutes to go. Let me ask uh, uh, one easy question for all of you. What's the role of a university like Stanford? And have you heard, you heard from Steve Graham and uh, Ian and Arun this morning, the plan for the new school, we, we will have a kind of data-centric uh, to help to coordinate all the data related to the sustainability and the climate change, et cetera. How, we, how can we work with you? We need some guidance. We can start from Thomas, from okay. industry, then to the public, federal perspective, then to the IT side. So there is a, a very strong symbiotic relationship between academia and industry, at least in our industry. So we are uh, energy industry is not a particularly R&T uh, heavy uh, part of the business. We are not the people like uh, the chem chemistry or pharmacy who uh, put 10, 15% of their turn turnover into R&T. Uh, traditionally, a lot of R&T happens at our sub-suppliers or in cooperation with partners, with uh, universities. And for us, uh, let's say, uh, cooperation with universities was always a, a large provider of impulses and a path maker for progress for in, in our industry. Yeah, I cannot agree more. Um, I would like to see more collaboration. So um, this is a great uh, forum. This is a great way to talk about things and explore what others are doing. And then together, we should start coming up with solutions together with industry with academia, um, with the federal government, with the state. Let's look at how we uh, come together, maybe do a energy transformation consortium, as I've been mentioning before, or something like that. But let's, or even a, I, I like the data common, commons, right? So let's come up with some common taxonomies and solve some problems together so that when we're solving those problems, they automatically scale because look at the amount of people involved, right? And so significant impacts together so that we all weigh in and buy in on the outcomes. Good, cool, huh? So I'd first like to object to your phrase there, universities like Stanford. There's only one and Stanford has redefined the way so many different things happen. No, seriously, look at this, somewhere around here is a photograph of, of uh, Terman. Terman came up with the concept of a, a stock option. Mm -hmm. That has had such a profound impact on everything. Um, every, so many different things, right? And we have, and Stanford is interesting, unlike some of these other universities on the East Coast, Stanford, the nature of Stanford has changed so much over the last, even the last, I mean, I went here 30 years ago, even the last 30 years, it has been completely different in its character. So we have no idea what all challenges are going to come ahead of us in the next 10, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years. Stanford was, one of the first to, to create this new school, right? I think Stanford can define its own kind of, can, can redefine what the role of a university is in this context. So. Great, I, I love your answer. So let me summarize what we learned. The action item to move forward for the collaboration 
Stanford needs to take the leadership role. Yep. And we need to create a consortium, which is open innovation can play. And we need more research funding. <laughs> Thank you, all of you. <laughs>